So as we mentioned last week, we're talking about uh, the relationship between addiction and, uh, well, addiction is relationship to sin. And in particular, uh, we said a couple of things. One thing I said last week is, let's be clear, we all have a sin habit. As far as sin comes, we all have a habit. We're all addicts in that, in that measure. Uh, and as a result of this sin habit, there's at least two things that present themselves. One, there's a continual, the continual fellowship that we once enjoyed as human beings with God is now broken. We live east of Eden, as we often say. Uh, and two, because we're sin addicts, <clears throat> we're in distress. All right? And the distress gets marked by a longing for God in a world <clears throat> marked by cheap substitutes. So we all have this longing for God and we're looking to fulfill this longing often in the world by cheap substitutes. So I know as believers, we, we understand this and don't see this, but we still see the substitutes in the world, the ways in which the world says, this is how you can have life, life. They don't say eternal life, but life, life. <clears throat> this will give you life. Uh, and and uh, instead of <clears throat> God's shalom being the standard, what we have seen is it gets watered down, and the initial watering down of God's shalom is something like human flourishing. You might say, isn't part of God's shalom flourishing of humanity? Yes, but there's a way in which we can use the, the phrase human flourishing or the words human flourishing and mean something apart from God. This is the way the ancient Greeks understood this. I mean, you might say, well, they talked about the gods, but they did and they didn't. They, they understood that reason was ultimately the way in which we can discover the true ends of things. Uh, and so for them, flourishing was a higher form of living than mere happiness. All right, so for Aristotle in particular, virtue. I'm not going to get too much into that. I just wanted to point this out, that we start from God's shalom. We then go to this idea of human flourishing, which is a sort of second best offering. And then from human flourishing, it gets further pared down to just happiness. I just want to be happy. Again, without talking about the ends or how we fulfill this. And then happiness seems to be something that's also kind of foreign to us. So then we might settle for something like self-indulgence. And, and, and I had a, a birthday last week. And we went to Seasons 52. No pluck them. Thank you. Uh, and... Uh, by the way, it was really neat. Jonathan has a custom that they just sing the last long line of the happy birthday song. I thought that is so great because people can get a little fatigued with that song. Maybe you love that song, but it's like, what a way to celebrate, but just do one line. Uh, so praise the, you know, great thing for Jonathan there. But uh, Seasons 52 has those little desserts they offer you, which I always thought was fascinating because by the time the end of a meal, you might not want a huge thing, but it's a little. And you know what they call it? A mini indulgence. Right, so I just thought, there's that word, indulgence, right? You can indulge in a mini dessert, right? So again, God, shalom, flourishing, happiness, indulgence. The standard keeps getting lowered. And even in the same time the standard is getting lowered, society and culture can't even satisfy the lowered standard. They really can't, never mind meeting God, shalom. They can't even meet the indulgence standard. So it, it just, we understand that. We live in the world like this. Uh, and I'm not about to say, as some say, maybe we should seek a return to human flourishing. And there's been a lot of people that way, uh, under, again, understood apart from God. I'm all about human flourishing when understood in the right relationship as we were created with a purpose, seen in relationship with God. But as I discussed last week, when it comes to addictions, we, we often only see the destructive patterns of behavior. Right? That's the sort of fruits that we see. And we, we learned this early on. Evil trees bear evil fruit, and sometimes we can just see the fruit and then understand what's going on here. But we don't always see the extent of control that an agent has. And that's where I was last week, that I said I was going to talk about this week, and that's what I'm going to do. We often see the behavior, but we don't see, we don't see the control a particular agent has. And we know there are a multitude of factors that go into the, the why we do what it is what we do. In fact, I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago when Paul says, I don't understand this. The things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. The things that I want, want to do, I don't do. So even Paul understands this sort of split will, split desire. And I'm going to try to explain that more fully today. That's, um, but we do have some clearer cases. 
as far as culpability is concerned. Uh, I mentioned Winona Ryder. That might be one of the ones that's a little more clearer, that uh, as long as this is a disorder, and we, we tend to see this as a disorder, we at least understand that there is a little bit of a mitigating factor when she steals something versus when somebody else might steal something, even if we don't want to say we shouldn't punish theft. All right, so uh, I'm not going to get political, but there was a one other case that I heard about that I found fascinating. It was the plot on Governor Whitmer and Michigan's life. All right, uh, and one of the things that I'll say about this very briefly is uh, there were like two guys involved and about 15 FBI undercover agents. And I thought, that's a little confusing to me. 17 people in the group, 15 of whom were federal agents, only two that weren't. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't go to prison or whatever, but I am saying how much of this might have been suggested, right? Hey, man, we should do this. <laughs> All right. Are there weaker members sometimes in a group that go along with other people? In fact, don't we say this to children? Be careful who you I mean, so there's at least some understanding that we might have that culpability is not always clear just by knowing that someone did X. It's not the whole story, all right? So uh, <clears throat> there was an experiment in the 1960s in Yale, Stanley Milgram, trying to test about, will people do things just because they're told to do so by an authority figure? And so they devised this experiment that had to do with shocking. And it was an actor, and they said, uh, you have to shock this person. So the authority figure's telling them, you know, the odds behind the curtain, you got to implement the shock. No real shock was delivered, but the person, the people involved didn't know it, right? <clears throat> and almost everyone did it. There were a couple that didn't. One was actually, I believe, a priest. And he said, no, there's God's law and then there's your law, and I'm not going to abide by this. And interestingly enough, Stanley Milgram thought, this is still someone who's responsive to authority, just misplaced, you know. Again, why can't his authority be reason, not God? So kind of interesting. But there was another woman who said, you know, they said to the woman, you, ha you don't have a choice, right? And that's great. You have to do this. And she said, no, sir, I have a choice. And she withdrew. Uh, but we know that takes courage. Not a lot of people would have that kind of, you know, have you ever been in a, in a position where someone presents something to you? You know what? I'll do the Seasons 52 moment. I won't say the young lady thing, but... Can I say the young lady thing? I just said it, so I can't help myself. Uh, so this, we're at this restaurant, and the server comes up to Megan. He was probably in his late 20s, and he kept calling her young lady, young lady, young lady. It was kind of bothering Megan. Like, I'm not a young lady. Like, you don't have to keep calling me young lady, right? Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, why did I say that? I'll get, uh, I had a point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it'll come back to me. I, I, I was almost too afraid to say it that I lost why I was saying it, and now it's just like gratuitous. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you, the courage. Have you ever had a server come up? First off, that takes courage sometimes to tell a server, I, and she did it very respectfully. I, I don't prefer to be called that way. Have you ever had a meal that wasn't particularly good, and the server comes and says, how was your meal? And you don't really feel that you can be honest and say, you know, I, I kind of think this could have been done a little better. Uh, you might just say, it was all right. It was good, because you don't necessarily want to get anybody in trouble. You don't know how it's going to work. So uh, my point is, we're not always in a position to fully grasp what culpability people have. But we do know that people do bear culpability, right? Uh, and we also know that we can also look at people like those two men. Why did they put themselves in a position where they could be misled? Or when we make one decision, what can often happen is we start making other decisions. It does become sequential. And decisions that we make today do, in many important respects, build on what we've done in the past. And so it's not like we live in any isolated moment where we're making unique decisions all the time. All right? It does seem to be that sometimes, at least, the choices that we make, the decisions that we make, do influence or restrict other choices or decisions that we also will have to make. So as I mentioned last week, I'm going to use this as my linchpin, is Pharaoh and Exodus. This is a very interesting case to me uh, because, uh, one, I'm a philosopher, but two, uh, I've just always found it fascinating. Because we're told in Exodus, in various chapters, mostly 6, 8, 9, but throughout the early chapters of Exodus, this idea of Pharaoh. 
And at the centering of Pharaoh is, did Pharaoh harden his own heart, or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And there seems to be evidence in Scripture that clearly says both. That, that Pharaoh somehow is responsible, and yet God also ordained it to be so. And you're like, okay, so how do I understand this in, in light of this idea of choice? Um, could Pharaoh have done differently if God ordained it to be the case? I mean, is God's sovereignty elevated, and it ought to be, or is it Pharaoh's decision? And if it's God's sovereignty, then how do we hold Pharaoh accountable if he really had no choice? That's what I want to get philosophical with this morning a little bit about what does it mean to have a choice, and the important phrase is could have done otherwise, as I mentioned last time. So uh, I'm going to introduce a pair of propositions. We have a couple of these. The first one is going to be simply... I want to do X. All right, so this is the first part of the pair. I want to do X, where philosophers just like to put X in single quotation marks because X is an option. I want to attend service later this morning, all right, whatever X is. I want to do X. And then secondly, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to do Y, I could have done Y. So the first one is I want to do X. The second, if I would have wanted to do Y, I could have. All right, so the second of these pair is a hypothetical. Right, if I would have wanted to do differently, I could have done differently, but as a point of fact, I don't want to do differently. All right, that, that's this pair. So I want to do X, and then secondly, if I wanted to do Y, I could have done Y. So whereas my desire in the first one, my desire to perform X and my ability to do X are in sync with one another. So if I have a desire to do something and I do it, there's no problem, right? There's no issue of agency. Look, I wanted to do it. I did it. The second one becomes a little more interesting because we, in reality, don't always know whether we could actually do differently. And yet we often say that. We could have behaved differently. We could have done differently. I'll have students come up to me all the time, which I love. They don't usually use hypothetically speaking. I wouldn't think hypothetical is that big of a word, but I've noticed over the years they don't use words like that anymore. Those kids today. <laughs> so, uh, but hypothetically, you know, imagine a student comes up and says, um, "If I, what grade do I have to get on the next exam to boost my performance?" And of course, the numbers are in the syllabus. They can figure this out. Even Canvas will often do this for them. But I take it a step further, and I, I disenable the Canvas calculation, which makes them really angry. Because then they're like, I can't see what the class is doing. I'm like, exactly. This is not a horizontal game. This is you game. Like, you, you don't worry about what your classmates are doing. No, seriously, I disengage it and noise them. But maybe I'm, I'm causing exasperation. I should rethink that. But at the same time, Let's, but at any rate, hypothetically speaking, oftentimes when students ask that to me, I already know they're not going to get the grade that they want because they're focused on the wrong thing. They're thinking if I just perform, but if you learn the material, chances are you'll do better without worrying about doing better. Remember, you become happy when you're not worried about becoming happy. You become a better student when you're not just thinking, I've got to get an A, I've got to get an A. It's like, okay, uh, motives matter. So. Nevertheless, I entertain the question, and I'll say, well, numerically, here's what you got to do, and, you know, uh, but can they leave the room and think, you know, I, th I thought about what he said, yeah, studying, what's up with that, uh, <laughs> come in the class, how dare he, uh, and I thought, I would rather spend that time cultivating my relationship with X, and that's a fair thing. Because you and I know there's trade-offs in life. If I spend my time pursuing one thing, it's often at an expense of another. All the while knowing that if I wanted to have done a different thing, I could have done a different thing. So the hypothetical is interesting because oftentimes we don't always know uh, whether we really can do something differently. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen like suspense movies where you see somebody coming on the crest of a hill and he's about to, he or she is about to do something bad, but the people in the house are partying, they have no idea. He's already locked the doors, but none of them have tried to leave. So they think the party's ongoing. When do they start to panic? Like the Titanic hits the iceberg and they might think, wow, that was a little rocky. But you don't start to panic until you, until you realize that you are now 
trapped, sinking, can't leave. Uh, so you might think, what if you never realize that you're trapped, sinking, or can't leave? In your mind, you think I'm perpetually free, but in reality, you don't really have a choice. But when we say that someone's not free, what do we often mean? Not the internal stuff. We typically mean the external stuff. Like someone puts a gun to our head. I mean, these are the examples people use. Someone obviously exhibits coercion, ties you to a chair. Well, what's the reality there? You're not going anywhere. Uh, but can we be in instances where we're not necessarily free, even though there's no external force presenting it so? I, I, I saw an example with Alex Honnold. I don't know if you know who he is, but if you really want to get sweaty palms and you have Disney Plus or National Geographic, Alex Honnold free climbed, free soloed, which basically is climbing with nothing but chalk. All right, El Capitan in California. It's like two Empire State Buildings. And just watching it, I started to sweat. I, st I mean, from the comfort of my chair with a beverage, I was sweating. I was freaking out. And, and you can watch in HD. That's what standard definition can never deliver. And you see him doing maneuvers, and you know at any moment that if he falls, loses a grip, he's dead. Dead, done. Uh, and they were trying to figure out how come he can do this when you and I would panic? It's discipline and training. Well, well, no, because there were professional climbers with him who were videoing him, and they didn't want to watch. You know it's bad when professionals don't want to watch, because what do they know? This is nuts. I can't believe, and one guy says, I'm never doing this again. And he's not climbing, he's videoing. So they put him on a CAT scan, and they found that his amygdala doesn't respond to fear the way the normal brain responds to fear. So they showed him images, control experimental group. And in the control group, yeah, so in the group that's normal brain's behavior, it was like flaring up. His, there was nothing. So he was like, does that mean my brain doesn't work? I mean, he started to figure out how. Now, I'm not saying that's all there is to the Honnold story that enables him to actually do the things that he does, but can that be a factor of which he clearly has no control over? Yes. Uh, when people say discipline, and I'll say that, Christianity is not get busy and do this. It's believe this, right? So it's not like you're going to discipline your way. No, no, no. Rest and receive. We'll talk about that later. But uh, do, do some people seem to have discipline in more capability than others? Yeah. So that's the kind of idea that talents and gifts are not always equally distributed in this world. Uh, and we don't always see that in terms of fairness or any kind of standard like that. So <clears throat> there's that pair of distinction where I want to do something and then the hypothetical. What if I wanted to do something differently? Could I? Oftentimes we accept as long as no one's externally preventing us, I'm free. But what I'm saying is... Don't be so quick, because just because there's no external threat doesn't mean that there's not an internal prevention here. But I'll continue with this, and, and we'll, we'll see it. So what I want to consider, returning to Pharaoh, is another distinction. The first one's the same, and I found that to be true. Try to use repetition. So the first one is, I want to do X, so that didn't change. So the first part of the original pair is still there. But the second one is a little bit more complicated in that it has more words. I do not want to want to do X. All right, so that can get confusing, right? I do not want to want to do X. That is something on a deeper level, right? So we have a first order desire. I want to do X or I want to do Y. The second is what we often classify as the will. I want to not want to do this. And that's where Paul comes in, right? So uh, you can have someone who's addicted to a substance who both wants to use the substance but also wants to not want to do it. I hate that I'm doing this, but yet I find myself doing this. That's the case where someone doesn't want to do something but actually finds himself in doing it. This is what I'm going to call the unwilling addict. Someone who's an addict, but is not, his, his or her will is not really in it. They wish it were different. We're not going to talk about 
necessarily, well, why is that always the case? Although we, we did some of that. But I just want to start with that understanding of what I'll classify as the unwilling addict. Basically, if you're looking for a nice summary, they fail, but they don't want to fail. As opposed to someone who fails and doesn't mind failing, in fact, gives in to the failure. You might say, well, whoever would be a willing addict? Pharaoh is going to be a willing addict. I'm going to explain that. But imagine someone who's in the throes of an addiction and loves the addiction. You might say, nobody really loves the addiction. Well, some people really do. And they never want to stop it. And there's very little help you can offer someone who is in love with what they're doing. That's someone whose will is in sync with their desire. The ones that are help, can be helped are the ones that basically have this sort of disordered desire. I, I do the thing that I don't want to do, but I wish I did not want a desire to do it knowing all the factors that go into that. And it's not always what? My choice. That's what I was spending that moment doing. So, uh, so to put this in perspective, again, the unwilling addict has a split will or the second order desire is not in sync with the first order desire. Where the first order is, I want to do X. The second is, I don't want to want to do X. And by the way, are there helpful things you can tell people to make that will become more effectual? Of course. If you have an addiction to alcohol, you probably shouldn't rent an upstairs apartment to a bar. Wouldn't we agree that's a good idea? All right, so oftentimes we can use these things and each other to help. Uh, but what if somebody says, I, I'm addicted to alcohol and I'm going to rent this apartment above a bar, and they don't see a problem with that, you might say, well, how much is it really true that your will is to not want to drink. I know I'm taking a little liberty here, but I'll just say this. Uh, I'm sure we all have people in our lives that can give us all kinds of advice. And let's say you ask for it, so it's not the criticism kind, like you're actually soliciting. Are there people that you can identify that you can go to who will pretty much tell you to do something that you really shouldn't do but want to do? You probably can identify people like that. You can also probably identify people that are going to tell you what? No, man. And so can you learn cleverly, and sin can be clever, can it, to avoid people that might not encourage behavior and then seek other, and you can say, well, I sought counsel, and 15 people told me, yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, you sought the wrong counsel, and we understand that. So uh, I want to talk about the other distinction. So I, I've given you two. I'm going to give you three. So the, 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 on, the un on the one hand, the unwilling addict, I want to do X, but I don't want to want the other case is, I want to do X, but I want to want. Okay, that's what I'm going to call the willing addict. So the unwilling addict, the second order desire, the will, is not in sync with the action. In this case, I want to do X, and I want to want to do it. That basically is the willing addict. And it's not always bad to have that. That could be a good desire, right? I, I have a strong will. I want to want to be a good husband, and then I want to be a good husband. So it's not always negative. I'm just using an example with addictions because that's when we often ask about culpability and could have done otherwise. So uh, in Pharaoh's case, what we see is what I would call, Pharaoh's a willing addict. He's someone who really does not want to want. He really wants to want. And now you might say, well, isn't there conflict in his life? I mean, doesn't, doesn't he actually show this? Now, it can be true that even the willing addict can be presented with conflict, but it's equally true that over time we are responsible for the kind of wills that we form, not just the things we actually do. Right? You can hold people responsible for not just what they actually do, but what kind of will they come to have even if it can be more challenging for some people, and it is, to cultivate a will as opposed to somebody else. But we're all will cultivators. Every time we make decisions, we're impacting which will we would want to become effective. And so one of the things that he's doing, and it's a mystery. I, I can't tell you, and I don't know what precise point this actually happens with Pharaoh in particular, or anyone for that matter. But we know that he is a man divided for a time but not really for a long time. And what we see is the same thing, that Pharaoh's will is at odds with God's shalom. 
his will is at odds with God's will. And that's where it becomes interesting that uh, as believers, our will should conform to his will and not the other way around. And Pharaoh was unyielding and not desiring to bend to any will other than his own. And so what happens over time is his will becomes what he does and God allows him to be delivered into that. You want your will, go, and pushes him even further into it, so to speak. So there's a way in which Pharaoh is very similar to even Cain when he kills Abel. So what we see in the, in the Cain case, and we'll talk a little bit about this next week, because often what we see is, talking about will, anger can often give rise to something that we're going to call envy, which can often lead to murder. But the murderer doesn't always see the progression. They don't always see, like, how did I get here? Someone might always say that, how did I get here? How did I wind up in the position I'm wind up? Not realizing, again, that chain, that sequence, that maybe someone's measure of control shouldn't be determined at the action level. It should be determined at the will level. Right? So you got angry. It led to this, led to that. And that's how, and in the Cain case, as we'll mention next week, Lord willing, Cain was given an opportunity to repent. So Genesis 4 makes that clear. Right? And if you know the story, basically, I don't want to do too much of this because Lord willing, that'll be next week's content. But the idea is Cain presents pretty much produce. And Abel's sacrifice cost him more. It was better. So God favored the one sacrifice, not Cain's sacrifice. And yet he says to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But Cain doesn't want to hear that. And so Pharaoh had opportunities like Cain did. And yet what do we know? Like Pharaoh, Cain's will was, I want to want to do my will. I don't want to yield to anyone else. And isn't that really what sin is? Idolatry. I don't want to acknowledge any other God but me which is a complete distortion of the very first commandment, right? So that's basically how we start to, start to understand this. So uh, Plantinga in his book, to sort of bring this a little bit more to a close, uh, Plantinga in his book identifies three questions. Yeah, so the book that I'm using, uh, and it's loosely using because I'm not, you know, but it's a good book. Uh, Neil Plantinga wrote a book, not how it's supposed to be, uh, basically a theology of sin. Uh, and uh, basically, he points out in his book three questions which I think are really helpful. Uh, and I wanted to sort of bring the discussion to a close with that and then open up to questions because I want to do a better job of allowing time for questions. And uh, I'll also give you a rundown for the two weeks ahead as well. His three questions that he asked as a way of posing it to addicts. In whose name is your help? Who or what is your only comfort in life and death? So in whose name is your help? Who or what is your only comfort in life and death? And then lastly, to whom or what do you ultimately belong? So in whose name is your help? Who or what is your only comfort in life and death? To whom or what do you ultimately belong? Uh, and we know that these are relevant questions because how does an addict start to change becoming being an addict? Well, admitting their helplessness. I mean, that's the first way out. Admit, running out of good ideas. We've talked about that. Um, so in Christianity, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's not do this. It's believe this. And if believing this, you'll be at peace. And believing what? The finished work of Christ. And so what is the finished work of Christ? That, that he obeyed in our place, right? That he died on our behalf so that we may become the adopted children of God. And adoption is a really important doctrine in the scripture, right? Because we are grafted in, we're all rebellious by nature, and yet it's by his grace received by faith that we realize the benefits of this great substitution. That... Christ, the better Abel, the one who offers the sacrifice that even supersedes anything Abel did, is in a position to pay the penalty for us. And not only pay the penalty, 
but also impute his righteousness to us as if we were righteous from the start, which is phenomenal. It's phenomenal just to, to forgive. It's another to actually, you now have my righteousness imputed to you. Uh, not imparted. It doesn't make, you know, we can't work that way. It's not how it is. It's a different concept. Uh, but as it says in Philippians, Jesus didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, right? We talked about that as well, uh, that he basically emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. And what did he do as a servant? He died, right? right? And how did he die? He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So here's the God-man, fully God, fully man, dying on our behalf. And that is a way of answering those three questions. So when you return to those three questions, and, and as sin addicts, we ought to return to those three questions. And, and what are the three questions? Well, the one way to look at it is, any other name other than Christ, you will have no help. All right, so where does our help come from if not from the Lord? So it's nothing in ourselves that's going to merit or work this out. Any other comfort, so who, where is our comfort in life and death? Again, if there is no Christ, there is no comfort. It's really bad news. And isn't that what Paul says? If the resurrection didn't happen, we should be paid above all else because we're the ones preaching Christ crucified. And what was Christ crucified? Foolishness and stumbling blocks to the respective persons. And, and the reality is we're still dead in our sins then. So this is a real problem. Especially for someone like Paul who was on the fast track to becoming the great guy. Right, uh, so the idea is any other comfort and, and if we seek to belong to anything other than Christ is going to leave us numb to the things of God. And instead, by leaning on God and trusting in his wisdom, we actually become receptive to the gospel notes in our lives. We start to see the gospel working in our lives and the lives of others because we're not solo projects here. You know, Real quick, if I can return to Alex Honnold, there was a brilliant moment where this guy has accomplished things that people can only imagine to do. And after he accomplished this, I would say spoiler alert, but they wouldn't probably produce the movie if he died, right? So you knew he was going to make it by the way they released it. Uh, and he calls his sister and he's like so delighted. It's kind of funny because it's like you just did something and it doesn't really seem like he's really delighted but he's trying to work up that I'm delighted. I, I mean, I would be like a maniac. You ever go to a sports thing? I mean, the Panthers went to the finals last year. My mom is now a Panthers fan. How exciting is that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would be more like so delighted. It was like weird, right? Like what, what a sort of letdown. But the, the point that, that I'm trying to raise is, uh, uh, I lost it again. I can't believe I did this. Yeah, you know, this happens to me more than I care to admit, and I'm on video now. So, yeah. This was like, are you listening moment. So thank, no, no, it wasn't planned. Um, so, but basically, you know, oh, that's where I was going. Thank you. He was climbing at one point with his friends because they're mapping out the route. And, you know, the end when he says so delighted, he wasn't really delighted. He was kind of trying to just fake it. You know when I found delight in that film? And I really encourage you to watch it. He was like, I spent the afternoon climbing with my friends. And they showed him walking on the mountain with his friends, mapping out the route. There's where the delight is, right? It's not, so free solo, no delight. Free group project, that's where I find life, right? So his, his community, his fellow climbers, who are what? Alex, I don't think you should be doing this. Alex, you're a mate, I don't know community, right? So uh, the more discerning we become of these notes, the more effectual our will becomes, right? And what's the will? Love leading to action. So in that way, we can look at what Paul is saying and say, as I spend time with the, believe, with the brethren, as I continue to immerse myself in the things of the Lord, I start to see over time that that second order will becomes more not, I don't want to, but I want to want. And then you start seeing the sequence going in a different direction. But any attempt to do this on our own might, our own power, is going to be ineffectual, at best, horrendous at worst. When you're actually going to lead people 
down a path where they're just going to feel like, I bought the book that said the, the, the 10 steps to the fasting you, and I quit at step two. And you're like, well, uh, there's some, I'm not saying that these books can't sometimes be helpful, but I am saying they can also just make people despondent by focusing on what I have to do, not what has been done. And, I, and that is not just a subtlety of words. It's the difference being fueled by grace and fueled by individual might. It's the difference of saying so delighted and really having delight on your face when you're with your friends. Um, and so with that, I will say, we ought to be continually returning to the throne of grace where true rest is received. Where, as TJ's mentioned and Francis Schaeffer's mentioned, we actually work hard to rest in a world that's not busy at resting. Uh, so next week, we're going to, Lord willing, look at, as sinners, we both transgress God's prohibitions and avoid his requirements. So sins of attack and flight. And then the last week, we're going to just look at the center of Christianity. And the center of Christianity is not our sin, but our wonderful Savior. So that's, Lord willing, where we're going to go for the next two weeks. And I thank you for staying strong. I know, six weeks, commitment usually gives way. Uh, any, any questions or thoughts at some time? Yes? It's not how it's supposed to be or not how things ought to be. I think that's how it is. Not how things ought to be, a breviary of sin. You know what happened? Uh, not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, so TJ will often reference books. Phil does as well. Uh, and sometimes they're in the reflections. I love the reflections. I mean, I would encourage you, even if you don't read them before the service because we're dialoguing with one another, read them at home. They're really good. They're really helpful to sort of put you in the right frame. Uh, Again, I'm not trying to put the law on you. I just did what I should said I wouldn't do. Uh, but uh, that book was really helpful. It's, I wouldn't necessarily classify it as academic, but I wouldn't also classify it as just like, you know, an everyday reading on the beach. So that's why I thought it would be good to use that. As a, and plus, people don't often want to talk about sin. So I applaud him for talking about sin in ways that's not, you sinners. I get, we all know that. And so that's where I was going. Mary. Judas is another interesting case. Uh, and again, uh, in that story, and we learned this, I think, last Sunday, the Sunday before when TJ was preaching on this, there's a moment where Judas, probably if you asked Judas, let me do it this way, Mary. What if you asked Judas, at what point did you decide to go, no? I don't know if he would be able to say that to you. But Jesus, being fully God, understood who it was that was going to betray him. But what does Judas do? He might have saw, you know, holding the money. And by the way, that tells us a lot. You don't trust people with money who you don't find to be trustworthy. I mean, no, I mean, who, why would you give the untrustworthy guy, hey, you have the money? <laughs> no. So uh, he probably was trusted in that circle in one way or another. And he, maybe he thought, man, we could have used this money in different ways. I mean, who knows? But you start seeing things in decisions. And really it's what? I think I know better than God does. And then it's a slow walk to greed. And really it could just be greed. Whenever someone says, I think this money can be used differently, it might just be greed, right? In his case, I'm sure it was, right? I, I want this for myself. Uh, so I don't know, as I said, it's a mystery. At what point does the will become one way or another? But we do know that Judas is not without blame. And we also know that Judas, like Pharaoh, was given opportunities. And not everything that happened was written. We're often reminded of that in the scripture too. More things happen than are recorded here. So it's not like we have the totality of the history story there. Um, so I don't know all the dealings, but I know spending time with someone for three years like that, you get to know them pretty well. So I'm sure there were a multitude of opportunities where he could have, there's that could have, chosen a different will. But when I look at the end story, and people often just look at the end, well, he did this. Yeah, but it wasn't just done in a vacuum, right? And, and much like other things we do, and that's what I'm trying to say about our will, cognitive behavior therapy has this at its center, right? So someone has an idea, and they don't understand how the idea leads to the behavior, and what can we help people to see? How 
this idea gives birth to all these other things and then learning to what? Understand that and then alter. So Judas probably, for whatever reason, started down a path, well, whatever, sin, unrepentant, idolatry, really, uh, and he's in the same position as Pharaoh that his will was done. Yes. Hi, Audrey. What we're going to see next week, Lord willing, is, and the David and Saul case is going to come up, uh, when, when David looks at Bathsheba, that's covetousness. Yeah. But Saul to David, that's envy. Yeah. And what we often know is uh, those kinds of things can lead to disastrous consequences. And we're going to talk about some of that. But if I can also just highlight this idea, you find out throughout Scripture that God seems to work differently than we do. All right? He favors, he favors, right? He favors, no, but it, it's good to remind us this. He, he doesn't work with primogenitor, right? He, he doesn't do first over second. He does second over first. He doesn't do stronger over weaker. Uh, was, was Joseph the best, I'm sorry, was, was, you know, David the best of the sons available? No, so, uh, so we do understand this. We're going to look at this, but uh, we're going to have to, yeah, so we're going to have to go to the next week for that, because um, last quick minute, and then we've got to go. I just want to tell you one of the things we do is this. everything is permissible because it gave us free will, but not everything is beneficial. So we have to, you know, I use that in my daily life all the time, saying I have this will, but I, is it beneficial for my relationship? Well, yeah. And, and there's a lot to that, and again, but <clears throat> I still have to start with the position that I am far into God's will, apart from God revealing that to me. So it's not like I can sort of work this out and think, uh, because I'll always go wrong with that. I'll start thinking, man, uh, <clears throat> you can't wear that ACDC shirt, because no believer ever wears an ACDC shirt. I mean, don't you know? So I, I can sort of go down a path, and, and the concern for us as a church is maybe not the kinds of concerns that maybe the outside world has. The concerns that we have is being the Pharisee. And Jesus spent a lot of time with the Pharisees. Like, you know, you were supposed to be that light and you weren't. So, um, and, and we're going to, this is great. So we'll return to this next week. And, and again, I'll, I'll have more time, especially in the last week for a whole bunch of questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time because I want to get us down faithfully. Uh, so let me pray for us and uh, we can do this next week. Father, again, we thank you for the time that you've afforded to us. Thank you for... The fact that you are God and we are not, and uh, may we come willingly bending our will to yours. Uh, may we learn to delight in the things that you delight in. May we not fall victim to worshiping the creation, but worshiping the creator. Pray that you would reveal to us the ways in which you have so much more in mind with concepts like love and beauty and friendship and justice. May we learn these things anew through your revelation, uh, by your grace, through faith. In Jesus' name we pray.